But I want to give you two examples that highlight the importance of mismatch. The first is adolescence. Adolescence is a new phenomenon. It is one that is pretty costly to our society, both the individuals themselves going through adolescence and to society as a whole. And we've got it all wrong. We blame the kids. If I just stick with females, and that's only because we have good historical index of when girls go through puberty because it's easy to get data on when girls have their first period, but the comments apply equally to males with some minor differences. We know that 250 years ago in Europe, the average age of the first period was about 17 years of age. In the last 200 years, it's fallen now to the average age of of first period in Australia is approximately 12 years of age for those of European descent. Fallen by five years in 200 years. A remarkable fall. Now, I'm not going to go into the detail, but in this book I explain why I think think this is just returning to what women evolved to do. Because if they live short lifespans, we believe that you would have had to have early puberties, a puberty of about 10 to 12, to possibly have enough children to, 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 for the population to have sustained itself. I won't go into the arguments, although they're now, I think, largely accepted by anthropologists. They weren't when we first put them forward. What happened in the, in me, in the immediate time was, of course, we developed farming and we developed cities. Farming, paradoxically, leads to bursts of undernutrition. Because when you're a hunter-gatherer, you can move to follow the food supplies. When you're a a farmer, you become at the mercy of drought and flood. And so you get periodic undernutrition. And we see undernutrition appearing in the fossil record for the first time when farming agriculture started to appear in the different environments it appeared in. First, and obviously in Europe and Mesopotamia, but it evolved independently in a number of places. For those of you who have read Jared Diamond, you'll know what I'm talking about. Secondly, farming allows you to have permanent settlements. Without farming, you have no reason to have permanent settlements. Permanent settlements lead to clusters, aggregations of populations, breaking up people into individual roles, Villages become towns, towns become cities, etc., etc. And on top of that, because people are now living close together, infections spread more frequently. And if you think about mo- many infections, like influenza, it originates from animals. And so it's the close contact with animals coming with farming that is probably the start of infectious disease as the major killer of humans. So we had the situation where puberty was delayed between 10,000 years ago and 200 years ago as cities got bigger, hygiene got worse, periodic periods of undernutrition delayed the age of maturation of of the female and male body. But 200 years ago, the Enlightenment came. Public health started to appear. Maternal health started to improve, and for reasons I won't go into, I believe it's more the improvement of maternal health rather than the improvement in child health per se that leads to the fall in the age of puberty. And so children are having... The girls are having their first period at 10, 11 and 12, not because of hormones in the water supply, not because of pesticides out there or any of that, simply because they're very healthy and their mothers are very healthy and they are getting biological puberty at the time they were designed to get their puberty. But, there's a big but, humans were designed to live in small communities. It is pretty certain that no human being 20,000 years ago ever saw more than another 150 people in their lifespan. And they lived in groups of 100 to 150. And I can explain afterwards why we are certain that is the case, if you're interested. But of course, and and all of those were people they knew within the same clan, nomadic clan. Very little trans-nomadic 
trans-clan transfer as far as we can tell. And our brains are exquisitely designed for that. Think about how many people you like to have to a significant event, a wedding, a party, a, a funeral, whatever. Probably you'll come up with about 150 relatives you really want to know and friends you want to know. Organisational design shows beyond 150 people you have to bait organisations up into bureaucratic nightmares. But we don't live with 150 people now. We live with thousands of people. And not all our communication is with people we know all the time. You're interacting, I think, I hope, significantly with me. You've never seen me before, but hopefully this is a meaningful interaction. Look at the number of people who responded so emotionally to the tragic loss of that TV uh, interviewer on, uh, with the tragic fires of last weekend. Most of them had never met that individual, and yet they had an emotional connection with that individual, judging from the television reactions I saw. You deal with the, tele the, 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 the voice phone from the telecom operator and you get angry when you can't get through to anybody to answer your bill. Um, you know what I'm getting at. You deal with thousands of people a year and it's quite clear that our brains are not well designed to deal with a, with a thousand people a year. Thousands of people a year. One of the surprises of the last three years has been the discovery that if you study the maturation of adolescent brains using very sophisticated imaging techniques, the adolescent brain is not fully mature until 30, 25 to 30 years of age. And the last part of the brain to mature is called the frontothalamic pathways, from here to the middle of the brain. And in layman's terms, they, develop, they, they, they generate impulse control. In other words, they put wisdom and judgment in relationship to reward pathways. Now, I'm, I'm generalising because obviously many kids go through quite well, but this has been a quite a dramatic surprise. Now, the three questions. Was this, we don't know if this is a new thing or an old thing. There's no way of telling. I want to do some work in a developing country, maybe able to get to the answer in an indirect way. But it's probable that it's a new thing for, on, because... And what we think's happened is that because society is so much more complex, it takes long to learn all the social skills to be fully mature. But on top of that, because we're so scared of what our kids do in the world out there, we've infantilised what we allow them to do. They're not allowed to do what I did as a kid, and they wouldn't be allowed to go off and play unsupervised for six hours a day in the bush down the road and you know, all the things we got up to as kids. And we think that's also slowed the maturation of the brain. And so I want to put this in context. Puberty has fallen by five years in the last 200 years. The age of maturation of the brain has increased. And again, for reasons detailed in the book, we think it's increased from about 15 years of age, 12 to 15 years of age on average, to about 20 to 25 years of age. So if adolescence is defined as the period of time between when your hormones are raging in your body because you've gone through puberty and when you are accepted and able to function as an adult in society, it's increased from about two years to about 15 years of time in that period. Now, does this matter? Is this Gluckman just, you know, talking a bit of New Zealandish? bullshit, or is there something real to this? Well, it's real. There have been studies done, extensive studies done, particularly in Switzerland, to show that the greater mismatched children are, or adolescents are, that is, the earlier they've gone into puberty relative to their peers, the more likely they are to commit suicide, to attempt to commit suicide, not just the obvious things of sexual um, Activity, drug abuse, violence, etc., etc., and it's obvious because you know your hormones are raging. You have all sorts of feelings. I can do anything. I can act out, etc., etc. You need to have the countervailing reward systems fully mature. Now, put that in the context of modern society with a school structure, a legal system, a social system designed basically in Victorian England 
which assumed biological match, where children would go through puberty at the age of 17 and be an adult by the age they were 18 or 19 and treated as such. Put into this context and you say, we've got to have a fundamental rethink based on evolutionary principles on how we treat young people. The second example I want to use or the, in detail is my tummy. Obesity and the risk of type 2 diabetes. Quite clearly, it's not just in our genes. In fact, all the searching for genes to explain diabetes and obesity has effectively been a failure. We can explain about 5% of the variation of why one person gets diabetes and another person does not based on their genes. And that's being very generous to the geneticists. And I have in my lab many geneticists doing this work. And so I, you know, I, I think their work is good, it's just the model is wrong. But what we do know is that the environment has changed so much in terms of nutrient loads that for many people, we exceed the capacity of their body to handle the glucose and fat intakes which are normative now in the Western world. And it's quite simple. They have, we are eating diets beyond our evolved capacity for our biology to cope with. But what we also know is that some children or some people can handle glucose, modern nutritional loads better than others. Some of you are nice skinny people and can eat what you like. I have a problem, as my wife knows. I get fat very easily and my blood sugar's levels start to get wonky and I'm in trouble. What's the difference? It turns out that that weather forecasting I told you about is the important difference. It's now quite clear, both from animal work and from human research, most of it, much of it from my own laboratory, but many laboratories around the world, that the fetus detects what mother is eating or thinks it's detecting what mother is eating. I say thinks because I'll come explain the problem in a moment. And therefore predicts whether it's going to live in a high-nutrient world or a low-nutrient world. If it thinks it's going to live in a low-nutrient world, it will change its physiology through changing its gene switches so that it prefers to eat fat in its diet when it's a child or an adult, and we know that's what happens. They change the set point of their appetite so they prefer to eat and browse and eat all the time. You know, there's people who love to get in the refrigerator every time they go past it. Um, they change the way their insulin works. They change the way their muscles work, which is one of the sites where insulin acts. They change the way their emotions work, which is linked to it. And therefore, if they're put into a high-nutrient environment, they predict the they will get fat and obese. Now, in evolutionary term, that makes sense. If you think you're going to live in a bad world, then you should lay down with not much nutrition around. You should always grab it when it's there, and you better grab fat if you can get it, because that will give you an energy store for the, the rainy days that are going to come. Conversely, if you think you're going to live in a good world, you don't have to do all those things, because the food's going to be out there in a good supply. And there's some caveats on that, but I'm but in the interest of time, I'll keep on moving on. Now, what we know is that fetuses take signals from mother from the amount of glucose and amino acids and hormones that cross the placenta to the fetus and change their genetic switches accordingly to try and make themselves better adapted for a rainy day or a sunny day. In other words, for a high-nutrition day or a low-nutrition world. But... There's a problem. Often those signals are misleading. Does it, it still will be evolved as a mechanism as long as it's right 51 out of 100 times. So we won't go, don't need to go down that line. But if the percent is not working, or if there are other reasons for the signal to the fetus to be less, then the fetus will predict a rainy day when it's actually going to be a sunny day. And the most common ways in which the fetus gets a misleading signal are the following. Being born firstborn. Firstborn children are about 200 grams smaller at birth and 
they, it's because the blood supply to the uterus doesn't open up so well. So they've been slightly starved in news flow. So they all predict a somewhat rainy day. Half the world are now firstborn children. You think about it. Everybody in China, every person under the age of 40 in China is a firstborn child. In Australia, everybody under the age of, say, 30, half of them are firstborn children because family size has shrunk so much. Secondly, women having their first child over the age of 35 because the uterus doesn't open up so well. Thirdly, twins, and you get more twins with, with women having their first baby later. Fourthly, IVF, in vitro fertilisation. All of these in ways in which lead, for various reasons, to a change in the signal to the fetus. And then there's... So we are seeing a greater prediction of a rainy day in a world which is giving more and more and more nutrition. And then on top of that, there's one other fundamental fact about the human existence. We walk on two legs and we have a big head. And to do that, we had to have this compromise of the female pelvis, which is relatively narrow. And as every woman here knows who's had a baby, it's a bit of a tight squeeze. Many animals, it's not a tight squeeze to get the baby out. And that is limited, and, that, and therefore there has to be exquisitely clever, evolved mechanisms to match the size of the baby to the mother's pelvis. And that limits, and that's achieved by limiting the amount of food that can get to the fetus. And that me has meant that there's a limit on the amount of nutrition the fetus can predict is going to be in the world out there after it's born, and that puts an absolute limit on our metabolic capacity. And so these now start to become explanations, and there's some very important scientific papers coming out in the erudite scientific literature showing that everything I tell you is not nonsense, it's actually the way it actually works, which comes directly from an evol evolutionary perspective on, how we, on what we are. Now, there are many other examples we could talk about. We could talk about what happens to women after the menopause? Why did the menopause evolve? How did the menopause evolve? All the issues that flow around that. We could talk about uh, many other problems that happen in life which come from mismatch. But the point I want to make is that Erasmus Darwin suggested that the, need, the role of evolutionary medicine, of evolutionary biology, was to help elucidate the theory of disease. What Mark Hansen and I, and it's been an interesting exercise trying to write a popular science book, two people together who come with different views, and this is not all sometimes, but it's work, has been to say it's time that evolutionary perspectives were taken seriously in medicine. The objective evidence is there that it's not all in your genes. The environment is very important. Yes, our genes, because of the way we have evolved, have limited the way we can adapt to the modern world. We can, can't change our genes, but there are two things we can do. We can change the way we live in the world, but we're not going to deal with the problem of living with 1,000, 2,000 inter, inter, social interactions a year. We're going to have to cope with that. Uh, we're not going to change the way we eat back to how, we, how our ancestors did 20,000 years ago. That's just not going to happen. So we have to learn out, we have to either accept the compromise, because after all life is a compromise, but there's one tool that I think we can use and we will use in the future to make things better. And that is the, develop, the dimension of development. Can we use the developmental aspect of gene switches and manipulating gene switches environmentally in ways that will lead to better outcomes for the next generation? And so I chaired for three years the World Health Organization Committee on optimising the outcomes of pregnancy. And we said there were five things that you could do for which there was objective evidence that would make a major difference to the way the next generation grew up in terms of risks of heart disease, diabetes, and I think now, though we didn't say it at the time, mood disorders and so forth. And they were simple. First, no woman should have a baby within four years of a period because her pelvis is not maximal until four years after a period. Secondly, every woman should have adequate nutrition by the, when she conceives 
and should gain at least 9 to 10 kilograms during her pregnancy through balanced nutrition. Fourth, smoking, drugs, all that stuff, obvious stuff, and, and the big one in the world is malaria and HIV in pregnancy. Malaria is a terrible... Malaria loves the placenta. It lives in the placenta more than any other tissue and makes a lot of harm for the fetus. And fifthly, that children's growth... They should be all breastfed for several months after birth and that their rate of growth should be related to their pattern of development before birth rather than just this fundamental belief that a fat baby is a happy baby, which we all grew up with as paediatricians 30, 40 years ago. So those are some ideas. Did they go down well? No. Well, the Americans under George Bush didn't like the idea that no woman should have of family planning. So that was the end of no woman should have a baby within four years of their first period. The other communities, cultures didn't like it as well, so the, the report got buried. But it's coming back. Um, the World Health Organisation is picking it up again now. I hope that you'll think about the issues I've raised. Thank you very much. <laughs>